Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on sleep and health, a wake-up call. Sleep disorders have a significant impact on our health and they contribute to a variety of other problems, including increased workplace and traffic injuries. The costs are somewhere between three to seven billion dollars, not to mention the 40 million bucks or so that we spend each year on sleep medications. In this program, we'll be looking at the latest research in sleep and sleep medicine, the range of sleep disorders and their health consequences, and the latest treatments, including some simple tools. We're coming to you across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. As usual, there are a number of useful resources available to you on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, and that's at RHEF. Dot com dot au. Now let's meet our expert panel. Dr Nick Antic is a sleep physician at the Adelaide Institute for Sleep Health in Adelaide. Welcome. Thank you, Norman. I'm not quite sure where else the Adelaide Sleep Centre would be, but it's certainly there. Nick's particularly interested in developing, in developing simplified diagnostic and management strategies for sleep apnea, particularly for use in a primary care setting. Dr Delwyn Bartlett is a research psychologist at the Wilcock Institute of Medical Research in Sydney, New South Wales. Welcome, Delwyn. Delwyn's an expert on insomnia and the use of cognitive behavioural therapy to help people get a better sleep. Dr Bandana Saini is a lecturer in pharmacy at the University of Sydney. Welcome. Her many research interests include the use of pharmacists in screening for sleep disorders and in actively promoting good sleep habits. And Dr Tim Peacock is a general practitioner based in Tintin Bar in northern New South Wales. Do you get much sleep, Tim, in a busy rural general practice? I get enough. Yeah. Get enough? Yeah. Welcome to you all. Um, Nick, what are we talking about here in terms of the range of problems that we're looking at? Well, there's a variety of, of uh, fairly common problems, really. I mean, the, the two clinically we deal with more than most is uh, obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia. Um, and, uh, but there are other rarer conditions, including restless legs and narcolepsy as well, that we may deal with. And then there's the, the bigger community issue of getting enough sleep and some of the occupational health and safety and driving safety issues that might go with good sleep, which we're increasingly recognising is important for good health. Well, let's look at directionality here. In terms of bad sleep causing health problems, what do we know about that? Because there's a bit of mythology in there, isn't there? Well, look, I mean, there, there is a little bit. Um, and it's a tricky dynamic, actually, because people who are unwell for a variety of reasons, chronic illness, often don't sleep very well. But, of course, that, that doesn't mean that they're... That's the cause for their chronic illness. There's, there's a study in the US uh, Nurses Health Study which has suggested that people that sleep very little or people who sleep too much might actually both um, do worse in terms of outcomes. Perhaps the too what much, sort of outcomes? Well, in terms of mortality and other various uh, uh, health problems as well. I mean, that might be, that again, getting back to the cause and effect question, might be that people who are, have got chronic illness might actually sleep a lot and therefore that might be the reason they're unwell. Um, it may not be only the health issues, though. I mean, there is increasing evidence that good sleep is important for good quality of life. It can be important for driving safety, neurocognitive function. It can be important for mood as well. So, um, you know, there's a variety of uh, uh, implications for health. And what about health problems causing sleep disorders, apart from the, the sleep disorders themselves? Well, yeah, look, certainly, I mean, that can be a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, a variety of chronic medical conditions can cause sleep problems. Um, chronic pain, of course, is one that might. And, and the link between psychiatric disturbance and sleep disturbance is a very strong and powerful one in both directions. And then chronic, other chronic medical conditions, I mean, people with heart failure often will have uh, obstructed or problems with breathing during sleep. There's a variety of chronic medical conditions that can affect sleep. And Dana, what's, what are the medications that GPs need to look out for and indeed pharmacists? Um, I guess, well, there's an over-the-counter uh, variety which includes antihistamines and um, some herbal medications that uh, people often walk into pharmacies for. Then there's also the prescription medications. So is this the, the, the cause sleepiness or cause lack of sleep? Um, that people come in. Or oh, the ones that cause uh, sleeplessness. Yes. Again, there's a whole variety. There's um, probably those that are used for um, common conditions such as hypertension. So, for example, beta blockers, um, especially the ones that can cross the blood-brain barrier. There are certain antidepressants, for example, the serotonin uh, selective reuptake inhibitors that can actually um, keep people awake if they're taken too late in the evening. Um, some other medications, for example, diuretics people use for heart failure or for uh, hypertension, 
can also cause sleep problems just because people have to wake up in the night so if they're not taken at the correct time um, and there's a whole variety of others that if you look at the literature on side effects that will say they will cause sleep problems but those are the most common for example. Tim as a GP what's com what are the commonest things you see? Um, I, I look I'd agree with Nick that uh, we, we'd probably most commonly see sleep apnea and insomnia as, as you know primary presentations um, but sleep will enter you know our consultations in uh, in, in various other areas you know um, mood disorders anxiety um, you know people who, who are generally stressed you know might be part of their um, you know uh, a, a work a workplace situation type of problem um, so yeah look you know it's 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 often not necessarily a primary presenting problem and it can cut both ways What's that and it can cut both ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Darwin, is there any such thing as good quality sleep? Can we define that? Oh, I think so. Um, good you know a good night's sleep when you've had one. Uh, well, yes, and people can say it can change their lives, but um, most people, perhaps when they have been good sleepers, just accept it, and a good sleeper doesn't know how to sleep. They just go to bed and go to sleep, whereas somebody who has had any sleep difficulties can put a lot of time and effort into their sleep, worry about it, and it becomes something that is quite difficult to attain. So why don't you give us a primer on normal sleeps before we start getting into the abnormal stuff? So this is the young person. This is a young healthy person who's 24. So down the y-axis we've got coloured boxes and across the bottom on the x-axis we've got hours of sleep. And I think it's important to stress a number of, of points. One that the black boxes represent wakefulness and being awake is a very normal part of sleep. So we will wake at least two to three times a night. But it's will we know that? Well, most people don't when they're young and healthy. So sometimes it has to do with the length of the wake and sometimes it has to do with the timing of the wake and our memory of it. So there are a number of different factors. We also cycle through the stages of sleep approximately every 90 minutes. We don't start the night in light sleep and finish the night in deep sleep. Most of our brain rest sleep is in the first one third of the night. So if we go back and we look at that hypnogram or diagram, black is awake and green is asleep. And the yellow boxes, are, they're representing the transition from being awake to going to sleep. And you spend about 5% of the night when you're healthy and young in that sort of transitional sleep. Now the green boxes are stage two sleep and it's light sleep, so we spend 45 to 55 percent of the night in light sleep, which is quite a remarkable um, sort of piece of information for a lot of people because they believe that good sleepers are in deep sleep for most of the night. So after we've been asleep for about 25, 35 minutes, we go into deep sleep or slow wave sleep, and that's the lighter blue box and the dark blue boxes. And during slow wave sleep, children will walk, talk, and have night terrors but they'll also secrete growth hormone. And um, adults will secrete... So it's a growing experience. It's a growing experience. <laughs> then we go back up and you have um, stage two sleep again and you go right back up to REM sleep and that's the red box. And REM sleep is dream sleep and it's almost the same as being awake. And during dream sleep, your brain is very active. You have small EEG waves and the other interesting thing that happens there, your body's semi-paralyzed so you don't get up and act out your dreams. So, so brain rest time so in the first one So your brain pulls the plug on the body. It does. So, so this is when you can get that sort of feeling when you're asleep, you've got a dream where you're being chased or something, you're running and you can't run, that your, your limbs simply won't move. Yes, and we tend to get um, longer dream periods towards morning and more lighter sleep of stage two sleep. So if you wake from a dream, after, particularly after about the second sleep cycle, about three hours of sleep, you can sometimes wake and feel absolutely wired. You're, you're, you're ready for action? Yes, you are. And does it matter where you wake in the cycle? Um, well, if you, if you wake, say, which is not that usual from deep sleep, it's very easy for you to go back into deep sleep or to go back to sleep, whereas if you wake after dream sleep, it may take you about 15 minutes sometimes to go back to sleep if you start thinking when you wake. And is there such a thing as a normal night's sleep lengthwise? 
Um, most of the epidemiological studies suggest that if we get somewhere between about six and a half and eight and a half hours, that it's, that's a pretty good sleep. It's, it's generally a U-shaped curve, so it follows along to what Nick was saying, is that if you get too little sleep or too much sleep, then that's associated with um, you know, other complications, morbidity and increased mortality. Okay, so th those are the cycles. And, but if your alarm is set to a time and you, you wake up at 6 a.m. Um, and that happens to hit your deep cycle or your light cycle or, or your light part of your cycle, does it actually matter to your sense of tiredness or refreshment during the day? Well, if it was 6 a.m. in the morning, it's highly unlikely that you would be in deep sleep unless you only went to bed at sort of 3 o'clock in the morning. And then you would wake up feeling awful, jet lagged and a woolly brain. Right. Whereas if you woke um, from lighter stages of sleep, such as stage two, it's easier to wake up. There's less distance to travel. Yes. Okay. You might be interested to know that there's a, a company in America promoting an alarm clock that uh, can wirelessly measure your EEG and tell you uh, what stage of sleep you're in and not wake you until it's safe to wake you, if you like, which brings a whole new spectrum to being late for work. I was going to say, what did you say to your boss? <laughs> My alarm clock said it wasn't safe. So that's right. Okay. You want me fresh? You know, that's when you're going to take me. Gen, that's a good Gen Y, do they call it a Gen Y clock, do they? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you're older, it changes. Yes. And, and so let's look at the cycle when yeah. you're older. And I really think what is showing up there on that hypnogram is that there's a lot more transitional sleep. There are a lot more boxes that are black, so we get more wakes. And you don't get the same length of time in deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And so a question I often ask groups when I'm talking about sleep is that if you have a pattern like that, are you doomed? And the answer is no. It's really reflecting all the changes of age that are happening to the rest of our body and brain. Sounds depressing. No. You can still play golf. You can still play golf <laughs> and still fall asleep. But some people are more aware of these wake cycles. Yes, they are. So they feel they're not getting a good night's sleep. Yes. And sometimes when you're older, if people aren't um, active mentally and physically, then they may be sleeping more than um, what is perhaps a, a good idea during the daytime. So therefore their quality of sleep and their sleep debt will also be reduced. Okay, so more, so, so, and again, you need less sleep or is just the fact that you're waking more, is that a bit of a myth? I think it is a bit of a myth and, and Nick can make a comment about this, but generally with increasing age, we need about the same amount of sleep. It's the quality of our sleep that changes. And you just got to live with it. Nick, what changes that could, I mean, if you take exercise or whatever, can you change that pattern back to a more youthful look? Oh, I think, <laughs> I think that would be difficult. I think that would be difficult. And I think education um, is an important process here to explain to people what is normal sleep as they get older. Because if you have people come and they're waking one or two or three times and complaining about it, you might have to explain and reassure them. Um, keeping active during the day is, uh, is important for good health and important for good sleep as well. So some exercise um, and, uh, and keep, I mean, falling asleep for a couple of hours in the afternoon will take away from sleep pressure in the evening and fragment sleep and we certainly get patients to get into that cycle of sleeping during the day and then not sleeping well at night and then napping during the day and that would need to be avoided. I think a power nap would be okay but a prolonged sleep not so good. Now, some, some people talk about, when they talk, we're talking about treating people with insomnia, they talk about light therapy, that it's important to actually get light in the morning to reset your melatonin. Just tell me a little bit about body clocks and sleep. We have, um, I always like to tell people the story that um, a French astronomer in the 18th century put a plant in a dark cupboard and watched it. And the plant opened and closed its leaves for a number of days in total darkness, which is not what I was taught in biology. And, and really what comes from that is that most living organisms have an internal clock mechanism that regulate patterns of behaviour. And that's applicable to human beings. And our clock mechanism was not um, identified formally until 1972. So this is the suprachiasmic nucleus, whatever they call it. Yes, and we all call it the SCN because it's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Which sits under the pineal gland. Yeah, well it doesn't. It actually sits on top of the optic chiasm in front of the um, hypothalamus. And so really what it does is that we, uh, with light, and the light message goes via the retina to the um, SEN, it then gets relayed to the pineal gland. And when the pineal gland gets a light message, it suppresses the nighttime sleep hormone melatonin. 
And if it's suppressed at the same time each day or most days, then the brain gets an idea of what to do X number of hours in the future. Because our human um, sort of clock mechanism and timing of our sleep-wake patterns is slightly longer than the 24 hours that we live in. So exposure to light and dark actually reset it into our normal 24-hour environment. And does any light do that? Well, it needs to be of a certain um, strength, and we generally look at um, about 3,000 lux, which is outside light first thing in the morning, and it doesn't need to be a sunny day. And so we know also that if you're very close to an external artificial light, then that will have a similar effect, but you have to sit very close to the light. And, and there's some alarm clocks that will turn on a light for you, aren't isn't there? Oh, I don't think we've developed that technology yet in Adelaide, actually, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit, bit, bit behind. We'll tell you about it later. Um, so and the core body temperature story? Well, the core body temperature goes along with the light and dark, but perhaps I need to sort of say a little bit more that increasing darkness is the trigger for the release of melatonin. And melatonin does two things. One, it has a slight hypnotic effect. And more importantly, what it does is it lowers the core body temperature. Now, you can't go to sleep or stay asleep unless your body temperature starts to fall and continues to fall. Um, so being hot is a bad idea? Yes, and sleeping with an electric blanket in winter is not such a good idea. It's going to wake you up frequently. And let's now then translate all this to good, healthy sleep habits. Yes. Because, you know, what, I mean, what my understanding is it's, you know, beds for sleeping or sex. You're allowed to have sex wherever you like, but you know, but bed is for that, no television or computers or work, that sort of thing. And there's also this thing about core temperature that you can take a hot bath, but it's got to be two hours beforehand so that you get that body temperature drop. Just take us through some of the things that you talk about. Well, I, th I think you've been summarising that very well. One of the things to avoid is exercise close to bedtime because you can get an elevated internal or core body temperature and then it makes it very different for sleep onset to occur. So you need a gap to cool down and slow down so that sleep onset will occur. Perhaps most importantly, we need some time out or wind down time so that we can have a demarcation line between sort of work and sleep. And sleep needs to be something that we can do without putting effort into it, without thinking about it, because it's a really nice thing to do, not that I have to get sleep in order to be able to perform the next day. You're putting pressure on yourself. Is insomnia a real thing or just somebody who's worried about the fact they're not sleeping? Well, often insomnia is triggered by somebody worrying about something and then that worry may actually be resolved and the person is left worrying about the poor sleep. So we're really looking at, we're looking at triggers, we're looking at things that maintain the poor sleep and um, that's an ongoing problem. And Nick, we've been confused about insomnia because a lot of the research is in you know, getting poor university students to and sleep depriving them and saying that's equivalent to insomnia where a lot of the story about insomnia being bad for you comes from. Yeah, look, I think. I mean, sleep deprivation is a whole different area, really, and if you're going to sleep deprive university students or anybody, you'll see decrements in performance over a period of time. Um, I think the story of insomnia is different, you're absolutely right, and um, I mean there is this issue sometimes of people misperceiving their sleep and they think that they're sleeping very poorly but when you measure it, they're actually sleeping really quite well um, and I think sometimes that can be a helpful adjunct to their therapy. And when you study people with insomnia, they're actually performing extremely well. There, some people call them overachievers. Yes, and um, we wonder whether it's um, because they have high levels of cortisol and ACTH. Now. Um, we know from research studies where they've done half hourly blood assays that in individuals with insomnia do have high levels of cortisol and ACTH. So is that the trigger for the insomnia or is it an adaptation to poor quality sleep so that they can maintain their performance during the daytime? But perhaps more recently was a paper that was published um, this year that shows that individuals with insomnia are actually faster at short reaction time tasks than um, people who sleep well. So almost hyper aroused. Yes, and then if you put them through a cognitive behavioural treatment program, they then become slower. But prior to So you cause car accidents, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Car accidents, perhaps with most individuals with insomnia, are probably due to inattention. 
um, and the difficulty of just sort of being aware and having a, an awareness that's safe for you to drive. But the interesting thing about the study that I started to talk about is that complex tasks that are, are quite involved are often very difficult for individuals with insomnia put them in a treatment program and their performance actually improves on the complex tasks. So there's lots of different things happening. What about sleep medications, um, Bandana? I mean, they've got a bad rap and we still prescribe them by the bucket load. <coughs> yes, I think we do see quite a lot of uh, prescriptions in the pharmacy. <coughs> well, I guess the ones that are prescribed are um, have shown efficacy, but there are cautions that um, go along with them. So for example, they shouldn't be used for longer durations. Um, they shouldn't be used in populations who are at risk, for example, the elderly, um, because of a varied uh, um, metabolism or because they've got other conditions or um, in people who may have a, another condition that uh, will interact with that particular medication. So I think we need to exercise a lot of caution when we dispense um, these medications, but we certainly do see a lot of prescriptions. Tim, do you think there's ever a case for prescribing sleep medications? I mean, if you read the literature, you think, well, why would you ever do it? Mm. Well, certainly I think in the sh as, as short-term adjunctive treatment for um, improving sleep, um, particularly in um, people with mental health problems, um, I, I think it's certainly indicated there needs to be a very firm guideline about you know, short-term use and good information about the potential for de um, tolerance and dependence um, that goes along with that. What's your advice on sleep medications, Stone? I, I'd agree with Tim. I, I think that particularly in the case of bereavement or an accident or something like that, that people do just need to have a little bit of help. But as long as it is for a short term and then you're able to step in and sort of say, OK, so now let's look at what's actually happening with your sleep patterns. Have you gone into a sort of uh, pattern where you're spending many hours in bed because you feel so awful and you're grieving. And that it's to be able to talk through the underlying pro, um, problem and then wean somebody slowly off the medication. Let's go to our face, first case study. Charles is in his early 40s and tells his general practitioner, who's Tim, that he's no trouble falling asleep, but he has multiple awakenings during the night. And he wakes up in the morning feeling unrefreshed and feels tired. His wife says that he snores and occasionally stops breathing for 30 seconds or so. When you look at him, his blood pressure is 40 or 90. He's put on a fair bit of weight since his last visit 12 months ago. Your patient, Tim? Um, yeah, well, look, you know, in the face of it, you'd, you'd certainly be wondering about, um, you know, a, a picture of sleep apnea with the snoring and, the, um, and the, the story of occasionally stopping breathing overnight. But you'd certainly want to be, you know, as always, taking a good history and, uh, and performing examination to, to, you know, look for other problems, you know, depression, anxiety, um, congestive cardiac failure, well, it would seem less likely in this sort of case. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that, that's the, the general sort of approach we should be taking in initially assessing this chap. Mm. Nick? I think that it's a very fair summary of the whole situation. I mean, I think the clinical history certainly sounds like obstructive sleep apnea is a possibility, but you need to consider all things, and, and just not getting enough sleep might be an issue. Um, I guess the, the, the stop breathing episodes make you wonder, um, and uh, you know the link between potential link between sleep apnea and hypertension, and the fact that he's put on weight would again make you wonder about sleep apnea. I think there'd be an indication for doing probably doing a sleep study in this sort of situation to further investigate. And if you're in a country town and you can't get access to sleep studies, which I would imagine is a fairly common problem, issue? Well, yeah, no, look, I think it is. I mean, I think, um, I think the access to sleep studies is improved on where it was, but it's a complicated test and the access is not always there. But in does it change your management? If um, he doesn't score high on a depression scale and you've got this story, hasn't he got into approved otherwise and just whack him on a CPAP? Well, look, I mean, some would, some would say that's a reasonable step. I, I, well, I the CPAP manufacturers would. I think the CPAP manufacturers, some may, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, this is an important condition to diagnose and it's important to think about the range of treatment options, the severity of sleep apnea. I mean, CPAP is a, is a challenging therapy. I mean, is it the right option in this situation? Does he need to go to that extent? Can he just do some of these lifestyle things and uh, lose some weight and, and so on? Uh, and there are some other treatment options apart from uh, CPAP for sleep apnea. So. 
I think it's a bit of a simplistic way of dealing with things, really, and I think we need to make the diagnosis in this situation because if it is sleep apnea, it's potentially a lifelong diagnosis here, and we need to, to work our way through it in a logical way. Darwin, what, happen, what would happen if he scored high on depression and you suspected sleep apnea? What's, what would you be starting to think of here, if anything? Well, there are a percentage of individuals who have obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia and are depressed. So you Understandably so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So your approach would be to treat both or treat the, treat the sleeping problem first and then see what happens to the depression or what? Um, sometimes it's, it's useful to treat the insomnia first and then the obstructive sleep apnea. But if somebody has a severe obstructive sleep apnea, then we're looking at a life-threatening situation and um, you would be wanting to perhaps do them in tandem at the same time. What do you do in a sleep study? Well, um, patients will come into a sleep laboratory and um, usually, and there is a bit of a, a push now towards doing some home sleep studies as well, where people will come in and be wired up and go home. Uh, they'll be attended by a technician and they'll have a series of monitoring, which would include EEG and oxygen saturations and uh, thoracic and abdominal bands. It's quite complex measurements. Might take about eight hours or so of recording time. They'll be analysed by a uh, technician the following morning or soon after and scored and then a physician will come in and uh, review the data and try and make an overall interpretation of the, the clinical situation. So it is a, it's quite a time consuming and labour intensive process and I think one of the ways we've got to go is to find some simpler ways to help access for the condition. We'll come back to that in a moment. So how common is it? How common is obstructive sleep apnea? Well, um, the, it depends on how you define it, of course. I mean, if you're talking about breathing pauses during sleep, it can be very common. If you're talking about obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome, which is breathing pauses during sleep and daytime sleepiness, the study in, uh, from Bustleton in Western Australia suggested 3% of adults. Now, that's about a 10 to 15-year-old study, so, and the population is heavier since that time, so it's almost certainly more. Um, and similar sort of studies in India have suggested a prevalence of 7%. So I think if we were working in that sort of uh, framework, we'd say that it's quite a common condition. But there's a spectrum of disease severity, of course, and not everybody with sleep apnea will need treatment. Um, I think we've got a, a, a graphic of one of your hypnograms, or whatever you call it, and looking at the sleep program. Yeah. What, what's, what happens? Yeah, well, look, it's, it's to give an idea of the complexity of the measurements and really show how wonderfully wise we are. That's the main reason I put it up. But um, apart from that, if you look from the... I mean, this is somebody with very severe sleep apnea. Now, this is 20, a 20-minute 20 recording. And if you look at the line third from the bottom, there are brief pauses you can see there that are, uh, that are apnea, cessations of breathing. And the line directly above that is the oxygen saturation, which you can see dropping repeatedly. So this person is stopping breathing, their oxygen saturation is falling, and then they're having a brief wakefulness episode from sleep, some of which they may perceive and many they may not. And the cycle is repeating itself. And in this 20 minutes, this person's woken every minute and they've had about 20 apneas. And it can be, uh, you can see 100 hour arousals from sleep per hour in the most severe of cases, and that would be a, a very symptomatic patient. And what are the risk factors? Well, um, in adults, uh, weight is a major factor, um, probably the major factor. Um, and other things that can predispose people, certainly in younger adults, tonsillar and adenoid hypertrophy, and in children, that's a big factor. It's an anatomical disease more in children. Um, various skeletal and craniofacial abnormalities might be an issue, retruded chin and so on. But then there are some people that just their breathing is more unstable, particularly in lighter stages of sleep. And it can be a condition we see sometimes in people of near normal or normal body weight. Um, it's not always associated with So weight. an abnormal anatomy in the upper airways? Well, potentially for some. I mean, I, I think it, it's not only the, really the anatomy of the upper airway, it's the collapse of the upper airway by external forces sometimes. And, um, so the fat in the neck? Potentially, potentially, or even fat in the tongue as well. That might be an also, also a factor, maybe fat lining the airway. Um, and some people's airways are inherently more collapsible than others as well. So it's quite a varying disease in that respect. Not everybody who has a BMI of 50 will have sleep apnea. So if Tim says, you know, there's a holding pattern, we're going to lose, try to get you to lose some weight, Charles, um, and Charles says, well, if it's, you know, I've tried before, you know, what's the buy-in here if I pay off here if I lose weight? What's the statistic? 
Well, if they've got sleep apnea, the, the rule of thumb is if they can lose 10% of their body weight, their sleep apnea severity will drop by about 30 to 35% or so. So if we're talking about a 100 kilogram male, 10 kilogram weight loss can be, a, um, uh, can be very helpful. I mean, we don't have the advantage here of knowing if this man is, has got sleep apnea or yet because he hasn't had a sleep study, but weight loss is always helpful. It's helpful to sort snoring as well, of course, and it's, it's of course important for good health as well. So I agree, I think it'll be an important thing and I think probably something that we don't always well do when they come to us is that we can treat them but we really need to focus on, the, on a primary factor here and that's weight reduction, which is not easy of course. Got a question from Graham, a general practitioner from Warren in New South Wales. Once a patient has had a sleep study and been diagnosed, how does he access a CPAP machine? <coughs> um, well, that would depend a little bit on, um, on the circumstances, the state and the different funding opportunities, but not to bore you with too long an answer. Usually in most states, if they've got a healthcare card, there would be public access through various uh, uh, clinics to <coughs> publicly funded CPAP. Um, that would be the case in our laboratory. Our CPAP nurses would set them up. If they're privately insured or they don't have a healthcare card, there are a variety of private suppliers that will supply CPAP usually and ideally on doctor's prescription and they would then help patients learn how to use the device, fit the mask and so on. More and more pharmacists are doing that, aren't they? Yes, there are quite a few pharmacists who are um, retailing CPAP through their pharmacies. I just have a quick um, comment to make. There's no legal prescription required for CPAP, so um, if you have patients that walk into a pharmacy that's uh, retailing a CPAP machine uh, of um, and that patient requests CPAP, um, the ideal response w would be that uh, you, know, you should get a proper diagnosis, isn't it? Because otherwise it's hard to set them on a pressure. I, I quite agree with that. I mean, I think really this, this whole process needs to be supervised and carefully thought through. Um, I don't think CPAP is a great therapy if you only snore. Now, it can be helpful, but I just think it's a, it's a fairly um, significant treatment for simple snoring, for example, and that may be the situation uh, presenting there. So, look, I think uh, most of our CPAP suppliers will insist on a doctor's prescription and some sort of supervision of the whole process. It's a safe treatment, CPAP. So just take us through it. What, what happens? Okay. Well, uh, let, let's take this patient here, Charles. He would come to see us. He would have a sleep study. We would review the data and um, make a clinical decision. And if we thought CPAP was indicated, we would um, do one of two things. Either they would have a CPAP titration in the laboratory where the uh, CPAP pressure is manually titrated by the technical staff, or they may take a home... So this is via nose mask? Via nose or full face mask, yes. Yeah, so there's a mask that fits over the nose and mouth, and there's a third mask option that just goes into the nostrils as well. There's a variety of masks out there. Um, the other option is to use a home tight auto titrating CPAP device to, um, uh, to, which automatically will adjust the pressure depending on changes in upper airway size to set a pressure or that may be in fact the device that people prefer to use although it's a lot more costly. One of those ways to set the pressure and then they would go and usually have a trial of therapy. Almost always they can rent the machine for a month or so. They need very good support through the process to fit the mask and work through some of the side effects, nasal blockage and a dry mouth from mouth falling open. It's, it's got its challenges. It can be a very effective treatment, but it needs to be uh, carefully thought through and carefully managed, particularly in the first month or so. Too many issues? Uh, with, with gaining CPAP? Yeah. Mean, or, um, no, I mean, uh, it's useful that Nick's outlined it for us because really, again, from a general practice perspective, the, um, the transition between your sleep study and gain a CPAP machine can sometimes be a bit of a mystery. Uh, it's something that tends to happen at their end. Um, and what certainly, again, you know, uh, maintaining support once the CPAP has been titrated and, uh, and it started to, started to be used is, is very useful. What about mandibular splints? Because they're almost as effective, aren't they? Um, no, I don't think they're almost as effective, but they can be very effective. Um, I mean, they're a top and bottom plate that bring the lower jaw forwards uh, compared to the upper jaw. Um, they need to be very carefully made um, and uh, a careful assessment of how much uh, uh, protrusion is possible. 
Um, for people who snore, that can be a very effective therapy for simple snorers and for mild sleep apnea as well. So you've got to be properly fitted with it from, by a dentist? Look, I think it's a really important thing, yeah, and they have to be very carefully made. I mean, there are some boil and bite devices that really probably aren't terribly effective that people will see um, available out there, the old football mouth guard sort of thing, not terribly effective. As you get towards more moderate to severe sleep apnea, they're not as effective as CPAP in most patients. You can occasionally have a win, of course, and some patients like them because they're not quite as... Is, um, intrusive, if you like. So you'll sometimes use a mandibular splint on the way to CPAP? Well, we might sometimes. We, 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 I mean, you know, again, if, if you've got more moderate to severe sleep apnea, we would usually go down the line of CPAP first, but not everybody tolerates CPAP, and a mandibular advancement splint can be a second-line therapy. If you've got more mild sleep apnea, well, then a dental splint is absolutely in play. And if you only snore, well, that can be a very effective therapy. Now, I, I think I recently covered a story, in fact, from Adelaide, suggesting that uh, we're not very good at selecting patients for surgery and often they're ending up with surgery too quickly without going through the hoops. Well, yeah, I mean, that study was from Adelaide, but not about Adelaide because we're actually very good at that uh, whole process. Absolutely, yeah, the, the, the best. Yeah, the best. yeah, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, look, surgery and sleep apnea, it's, it's different. In children... Uh, very effective. Uh, removing tonsils and or adenoids can be curative in the right patients. In, an, in the adult population, it needs very careful consideration. Our approach really is it is, it's, dare I say, it last ditch sort of stuff most of the time when other therapies have failed and you have severe untreated sleep apnea. And there's several operations in play. There are a variety of operations. I mean, uh, I should say that if you've got big tonsils, even you know, as a 20 or 30 year old, that can be curative sometimes. And I think you need, you need to look in the airway and see if there's anything there. The more complicated operations, be they um, uh, palatal advancement or um, uh, various maxilla mandibular advancement surgeries, are very complicated surgeries. And multi stage. Multi stage often, not available widely, and, um, and need a very skilled surgeon. I think it's a real niche area in terms of sleep apnea so at the moment. Don't really. jump into surgery too early. Probably not tonight, no. <laughs> Let's go to our next case study, who's James. He's in his 50s and asks his local pharmacist for a good, who's you, uh, Bandana, for a good vitamin supplement, saying he's suffering fatigue during the day and often feels hyped up. He manages a large rural property. He's having difficulty concentrating and performing his tasks, especially in the early afternoon. But he tries to drink a fair bit of coffee to stay alert. He gets off to sleep quite well, but wakes up and has difficulty getting back to sleep. His wife tells him he occasionally snores, but his breathing seems normal. In other words, he's not stopping breathing. What are you going to do with him in your pharmacy? Okay, he's probably standing close to the vitamin shelf. Um, I might take him to a little corner where we can talk without other people. Away from the valerian. <laughs> Away from the valerian. Um, would probably want to ask a few um, questions about um, when his symptoms started. Is there a pattern? How lately has this occurred? What else is happening in his life? Probably get a feel for any other medical conditions that he's diagnosed with. He's talking about being wired, so he may be having some stress uh, issues. Um, Maybe check his medical hi medication history on our dispensing computer to see if he's got any medications that might be affecting uh, being 50. He might have some of the you know, usual cardiovascular type medications. Um, and then try and build a picture of uh, what's happening. I might um, dissuade him from the vitamins if he's having an adequate diet. You know, he doesn't really need to supplement and that's not going to really help him sleep. He, he says that he can get um, into sleep quickly but he wakes up so that's kind of bordering into the definition of insomnia which is you know having difficulty initiating sleep or maintaining or getting up unrefreshed so to my mind I would um, probably feel um, you know I would talk to him about this issue and maybe uh, send him off to my colleague here How <laughs> at the surgery. <laughs> Tim what are you going to do for him? Um, Send it back to the pharmacist from the <laughs> area. <laughs> Quite possibly. Uh, look, you know, again, he needs a, a good general approach. Um, you know, he, he's, uh, he's a farmer, he's in his 50s. We want to know that, you know, he, he's, he's not depressed, that um, the, um, the drought hasn't had too much of an effect. And, um, do you that, have any favourite sort of screening tools for this? Or do you use anything to assess him? Um, well... Probably not, not routinely, but you know things like the, um, you know the, the Atworth sleep score um, is something that would come to mind as a useful tool. Um, 
you earn and, and whether you have the time to go through that in general practice is, is up to the individual. But um, certainly in a, you know, a general approach to him and um, uh, you, you want to make sure nothing else is going on and then you, know, you, you really need to sit, sit down and get a decent um, sleep history from him as well. You know, find out when it is that he goes to bed, you know, how long does it take to, to, to go to sleep once he's there, um, you know, when's he next wake, um, what happens then, you know, does he toss and turn. So Darwin, what do you think about him? Well, well, first of all, tell us about this Epworth score. Well, Epworth sleepiness um, score is something that we use in sleep clinics on a very frequent basis. It's looking at sleepiness in specific situations. And um, Nick will use it a lot in his practice as well. And we, we define sleepiness... So great confidence in Nick. Oh, yeah. I've never we, even heard of it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> We define somebody as being sleepy if they've got a score of greater than 10. So we're looking at a situation of zero where this does not occur, one has a slight chance of occurring, um, two will occur um, quite frequently, and, and Sorry, three. So what will occur? The being sleepy in a given situation, such okay. as um, after lunch without alcohol, um, sitting down reading. Um, the ones that we get most concerned about is when somebody goes to sleep at the traffic lights and they score a three. Right. So you would be looking at something like that and, and thinking, well, this person's got a high probability of having obstructive sleep apnea, so you'd like to do something about it. Now, if you had somebody who you perceive might have insomnia, they generally score very low on a net worth sleepiness um, score because they're usually um, hyper aroused, so they're not sleepy during the daytime. They this might comes be... back to our overachiever, high performance yeah, relative um, to their but, sleepiness. But maybe the wide inflection, perhaps sometimes more than the overachiever. And so they tend to score very, have very low scores, usually about two or three on the Epworth scores. Epworth, we just call it the ESS. And um, if they had a score of greater than eight, not as high as what you'd first start to look at somebody with obstructive sleep apnea, then I would be looking at the possibility that somebody with insomnia had some other sleep disorder, such as restless leg syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, or they may be very depressed. And tell me about depression, anxiety, and insomnia, and how you disentangle all that. Uh, if I could disentangle all of those things, I would probably be somebody with a magic wand. Like Nick? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do you assess him apart from, the, the, apart from this? What's the, what's I, think, your... I think one of the difficulties is that until 1996, if you were looking at anybody who had insomnia, you didn't have anybody in your study who had anxiety or depression. And if you were looking at somebody with um, depression, you would perhaps not describe their sleeping difficulties to any great extent. So it's only in the last few years that we have any studies where you have individuals with anxiety, you depression and people. sleep. Yes. And mm. so it's quite hard to pull out what is really happening and which is the chicken and which is the egg. And it, it is a bi-directional problem. I mean, until recently, it was thought that if you had insomnia, you had depression, fix the depression, then the sleep problem will go away. And now we know untreated insomnia will lead to depression in many individuals. So how do you manage this man? How do we manage this man? Well, I think you would spend some time, as Bandana was saying, and also Tim, finding out what's really happening for him. Because he goes to sleep in a reasonable um, time and he's waking in the middle of the night, it's quite possible that he's waking after his second sleep cycle. He may be waking then at the end of dream sleep, so his brain will be very active and it's very easy for him then to go from dreaming to thinking and worrying. And in the middle of the night when you are alone and you're the only person awake, that's often when all the problems of whatever is happening to you descend upon you. It's the great sort of cloud of doom. So what do you do for him? Well, one of the interesting things is that we, when we try very hard to go to sleep, it's, it's quite difficult. So what you may suggest to him is that he sits up in bed and focuses on the, uh, a point on the opposite wall in his bedroom and tries to stay awake in the dark. And that is very boring and it's very difficult to do because the little voice that's been keeping you awake now says, but you're trying to stay awake, don't you want to go to sleep now? And. Uh my understanding also is that there's quite good evidence that sleep, you know, good sleep habits that, that, that we discussed before, dealing with your core temperature, 
um, you know, the sleep, what other people call sleep hygiene in the bedroom and those sorts of things does work for insomnia? Not alone. So if you just did those sort of, those sorts of uh, things might like reducing alcohol and caffeine and, and not having your computer and, and all those sorts of things in the bedroom, they definitely help. But what we do know is that treatments for insomnia, such as reducing the time that you spend in bed to increase your sleep debt, or getting up when you're tossing and turning in bed, they're the treatments that are the most effective long term. So talk, tell me about sleep restriction. Well, what we often do when you're not sleeping is spend more time in bed trying to sleep. And the rationale is, well, if I'm not sleeping, at least I'm resting. And inadvertently, the individual is training themselves to be awake in bed. So bed becomes a place of being awake instead of a place of sleeping. And it becomes a very uncomfortable, unpleasant place to be. So the person can go to sleep in front of the television, they can put their head on their computer board, go to bed and they're wide awake. And so it's a learned response. And so if you can reduce the time that you spend in bed, you will increase your sleep debt because you're spending less time in bed and you're only um, really sort of going there when you can't stay awake as opposed to lying in bed and trying to sleep, then what we need to do will generally happen. So tell me the instructions you give him for the sleep restriction. Okay, so you'd probably ask somebody to keep a sleep diary for one to two weeks. You'd then look at how long they actually spend in bed each night and how long they actually sleep. And this is the individual's assessment of their own sleep. So then you would put the assessed sleep time and you would divide it by the time that they spend in bed and multiply it by 100 over 1 and that gives you a thing called sleep efficiency. And a good sleep efficiency is around about 85% or more but if somebody has insomnia you're aiming initially for about 80%. So you would reduce the time that they spend in bed that, so that their sleep time is going to be so don't go to bed at a certain time and don't get out and get out of bed always at this time in yes. the morning. Yes, and you can you can adapt it to the individual's needs. So if somebody gets but up, but it's early always getting anyway. up at the same time each morning. Yes, as much as possible. But if you've got somebody who's a real morning person, they might want to get up really early and go to bed a bit earlier, or you might want to do going to bed later and getting up at the same time as they were before. So you can mix and match that depending on what sort of type the person is in terms of morning or evening type. Okay, so that's sleep restriction, and then you can extend it slowly as yes. they start to sleep for a higher percentage of yeah, the time. often by about a quarter of an hour at a time. And Slow process. what was the other thing you said that was important? It's called stimulus control therapy. So basically what you're trying to do is to take all stimulation or anything that keeps a person awake. Um, you want to take the person away from the bedroom, and you want to take the things away from the bedroom that keep them awake. And so if you... Um, are having difficulties going to sleep or going back to sleep within about sort of um, more than about 30 minutes and it's a sort of a guess but most people actually go to sleep within about 10 to 15 minutes so we tend to say look if you're not able to go to sleep in around about 15 to 20 minutes and your brain is working overtime it's probably a really good idea to get up and do something else for a while something that's very boring and do it in very dim light so you're not stimulating um, the or preventing the suppression or the uh, secretion, sorry, of melatonin at night. Okay, and what about cognitive behavioural therapy? Cognitive behavioural therapy is uh, helping the individual to be aware of how they think about something. So if you believe that your sleep has gone away and it's never going to come back, that's a pretty daunting you know, thought to have. And that means that you're then going to be experiencing poor sleep for a very long time. But if you start to have an understanding of sleep and sleep stages and what you may have inadvertently done to train yourself into those poor sleep patterns, then you're able to set boundaries and it gives you the option of relearning sleep because sleep doesn't go away, we often train it away. And that's been shown to work in randomised trials? Yes, it's been, it's been shown to be very effective over the last sort of 20 to 30 years been around for a long time. We have some very large randomised controlled trials. And now the American Academy of Sleep Medicine see cognitive behavioural therapy as the first line of treatment. Nick, what's the correct advice with caffeine? We just had a question from a general <coughs> practitioner in Queensland. Well, look, I think caffeine can be a significant sleep disruptor. 
and I think it's it's best well avoided uh, in the late evening. Uh, again, it's a bit idiosyncratic. I mean, I think some people can tolerate it fine. You know, I mean, uh, personally, I can have a cup of coffee at ten o'clock at night, go to sleep straight away afterwards. But um, I think it's probably as people get older, they don't tolerate it quite as well. And certainly, we would be taking a sleep history here and trying to identify if caffeine was a contributor to their sleep disruption. And what well, Darwin, alcohol is the same. It's a bit idiosyncratic. It can be, but generally what we suggest to people is that they think about if they want to have alcohol, have it earlier in the evening because it helps you to go to sleep, but it tends to fragment your sleep in the second half of the night. And then if you have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, that will make the soft tissue at the back of the throat more lax, you are likely to snore more, and you're more likely to have um, hypopneas or apneas. Not to mention dehydrate you and make you want to go to the toilet. Yeah, and yeah. lots of drug interaction with some yes, of the medications yes. that you might be taking to put you to sleep as well. So no coffee, no booze. And no. <laughs> Diminished. Diminished. And we, we spoke about hypnotics earlier, but when is the right time to give a sleep medication, if ever? Nick? I think what Tim said earlier was pretty much spot on, really. Short-term usage in difficult situations, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it can be useful, but... Um, and I think there are a group of patients with very severe psychiatric disease that may, the reality might be that they may need a hypnotic medication, but um, certainly as a, as a long-term therapy, we would absolutely try and avoid it if we possibly could, and it would be a very small number of patients who would end up on that sort of therapy. Yeah. My, One of the comments I'd like to make in terms of hypnotic medication, which I think people often forget, is that if you're taking a hypnotic medication, you often start to lose the confidence that you can sleep and you become very dependent. And confidence about sleeping is a very healthy thing to have. So it's a mind game. It is a mind game and a very important mind game. Of course, some of the medications have been at least partly associated with some unusual behaviours during it's sleep. It's still not story. Well, um, yes, yeah, looking parts, and um, I mean, you know, it's a difficult cause and effect relationship. But um, when you get a patient uh, talking about sleep, eating, or other things, it does catch your attention. Really, they eat things like buttered cigarettes and cat food, and all those sort of things that you wouldn't normally expect people to eat. And um, uh, it's quite a striking history, actually. So it's probably not, an, not, not an unusual situation, also to have you know, the long-term benzodiazepine users who have had several failures in in mm. reduction. Uh, of their medication that really, at the end of the day, are probably better off staying on them so that they, they don't run into problems, um, you know, withdrawing or uh, having rebounds, in, insomnia, or, uh, or start going to multiple different practitioners to, um, to get prescriptions. Mm. I think even with the over-the-counter ones, the antihistamines, the Unisom and the rest of it that people come in to buy, Again, they've only ever been shown to work in very mild forms of uh, insomnia, not, not in the moderate sphere, and certainly not with people who have this crossover between depression, insomnia, and other um, disorders. And again, if you see the elderly population, there's issues with using uh, antihistamines as well. So it's hard to recommend something really uh, spot on for this gentleman. Let's go to our next case study, who's Jane, 35-year-old nurse at an aged care facility and works shifts. She has two young children and she comes to see you, Tim, because she actually felt she fell asleep at the wheel on the road home and she's had a couple of similar incidents before and she crossed over to the other side of the road. So she's pretty scared about this. She's not sleeping well generally and she's asking for a possible medication. Mm. Yeah, well, I, mean, I guess you, 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 your first instinct would be not to, to leap to the medication as the answer to this problem. Um, shift work's clearly a part of this a lady's life and um, you know there's, there's got, to be, got to be a degree of adaptation to that and, and so exploring the um, uh, you know the approach she takes to um, you know how she structures her, her working life and sleep is going to be important to try and work out what you know how, how she should best go about improving that situation. Additionally you also want to make sure again that there's nothing else going on um, that, um, that, that, that she's got no other medical problems or psychiatric problems that might be leading to sleep problems also. Delwyn, what's the story with shift work? Well, what we know from mainly case histories is that when somebody is a night shift worker, they generally do not become nocturnal. So they are sleepy at night and they're more wakeful during the daytime. It's, um, so it's your astronomer in the dark room again? Yes, it is. And, and 
um, one case history suggests that it takes 70 days and 70 nights for a human being to become nocturnal. And the average shift worker does not want to do that. They want to see their family and friends. They want to have a life when they're not working. And not sleep in a coffin and worry about stakes through the heart. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's, that's a very big problem. Well, we know that a lot of our major um, disasters worldwide tend to occur in the middle of the night. And because we're not so good at making good decisions, um, and it depends on what we're doing. So having a, 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 drivey, a driving, drowsy driving situation on, on the way home is, is not unusual for night shift workers. So, so what can we do about it? Mm. That's probably your next question. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> That's right. We can use light to, a, to an extent, so that if you have afternoon bright light, so if Jane is, is sleeping, now she's got two young children, so you'd want to know that, that how old her children were and how you can adapt this into her, what's happening for her. But if she could um, have bright light in the afternoon, and the problem is when she pro wakes up, if she gets a reasonable sleep, she's likely to have gritty eyeballs and want to put her sunglasses on because it's very uncomfortable. So she needs bright light before she goes to work and she needs bright light when she's at work, particularly in the first couple of hours of her shift. So employers need to know that? They do need to know that. And what would be useful too when she has a break, if she could actually have a 10 minute power nap and even putting your head down on a pillow at night can sometimes make a big difference to somebody's alertness. So by having the light in the early part of the shift, you can delay sleep onset. So somebody's then more likely to be safer driving home because their body temperature uh, is what we're really trying to do is keep them more alert and we're trying to sort of keep the body temperature down a bit lower so that they've got more